So I guess we can get started. Um, I'm delighted to welcome you all to uh, INAM, the Irish National Astronomy Meeting of 2021. Um, I hope you've all been enjoying the talks of the last couple of days and will continue to enjoy the talks tomorrow. Um, uh, I, this is the first um, INAM meeting of the ASI as a new legal entity, actually. And as the members will know, the ASI, the Astronomical Society of Ireland, is the new name for the ASGI, the Astronomical Science Group of Ireland, established in 1974. Um, and the society has been representing uh, astronomers on the island of Ireland, both north and south since then. And so as the new chair of this new entity, um, I look forward to leading the ASI towards becoming a more powerful voice for Irish astronomy to government through its lobbying activity um, and a voice in Europe uh, with its uh, associations with the Royal Astronomical Society in England and the European Astronomical Society, as well as indeed uh, worldwide um, representing Ireland uh, at the um, International Astronomical Union. Um, and I also look forward to strengthening the IS, ASI in its role in uh, supporting community collaboration through um, the diversity on its committee. We have members from institutes all over the country, um, institutes and universities, and also as amateur astronomers, as well as industry uh, representation. And indeed as well um, in community collaboration through running the annual science meeting INAM. I also look forward to more active involvement from the wider membership. Um, and an amazing example of this is the great work of the uh, SOC, the Science Organizing Committee for, for this meeting, um, this virtual meeting. They've done an amazing job, I have to say. So to conclude, I just would like to thank all of the members of the SOC. Matthew Hooten from currently located in Bern in Switzerland, Camille Stock located in Dias, Mark Kennedy in Manchester, Owen Farrell in Trinity, Meg Schwam in uh, QUB in Queens, um, Stefan Ardridge in Maynooth and uh, Catherine Patel in Galway, as well as committee members Mark in Armagh Observatory and Masha in DCU who have supported the SOC and guided them. And so I'd like to say a big thank you to all of those people for, for the great work they've done in organizing this year's INAM meeting. And then finally, I would just like to thank all of the invited speakers who've contributed to the meeting, uh, as well as indeed this, this evening speaker who will shortly be introduced, and of course, all of the participants. So I'll now hand you over to the SOC to introduce this evening's speaker. Welcome. It is a pleasure for me to introduce you tonight's speaker, Professor Michael Burton, who is the director of the institution where I also work, the Yama Observatory and Planetarium. Educated in Cambridge and Edinburgh, Michael has had an exciting career that included significant periods in the USA, Chile, Australia, as well as Ireland, and of all places, Antarctica, where for a long time he championed the use of astronomical observations that would particularly benefit from the uniquely dry and cold conditions of the Antarctic Plateau. Aside from his academic career, Michael is a passionate educator with an extensive university teaching experience and a long involvement in science communication and outreach. Since he joined um, the newly merged institution of the Amar Observatory and Amar Planetarium, I think he also embraced with passion the rich heritage of these historic institutions and their part in the long history of astronomy in Ireland. In fact, I think this is what Michael will indeed talk about tonight. So without further ado, please, Michael, take it away. Okay, thank you, Mark. So I hopefully I can share a screen. Let's just shout out if uh, that's, is that correct? Let me just over uh, here going. Can someone That's SOC great. shout out? That's great. Okay, well, thank you very much, Mark, and thank you very much for the organizers for inviting me here today. Indeed, this is a big topic. Originally, I, I guess I put this idea forward as a, as a, as a, as a discussion talk for, for the meeting, but I, I, you like the idea so much that uh, you asked me to give a public talk on it. And look, in essence, the, the, what I'm going to talk about is shown in the backdrop here. I have a bar observatory where I work and I'm the director, but in the front, uh, we have uh, 
and we have uh, uh, Dunsink in Dublin, and we have the famous picture of the uh, Whirlpool uh, Nebula, as it then was uh, it from, from Burr. Uh, I'm going to draw a thread that brings these three together into what I think is a fantastic bit of astronomical heritage, which indeed uh, should, be, uh, should be celebrated through the world. So this talk actually starts uh, from, from uh, an event in 2019 when I heard that uh, UNESCO, the, essentially the UN uh, uh, um, cultural organization, uh, inscribed uh, two, inscribed this official word, two new properties, uh, as they call them, for world heritage. Uh, one of these is uh, Jodrell Bank, who all the astronomers here will know very well. That's the famous, uh, the famous uh, Lovell telescope there. But uh, Jodrell Bank uh, near Manchester uh, for World Heritage. But they also inscribed a site called Risco Kaido, uh, Gran Canaria in the Canary Islands uh, too. So one of these was essentially based upon it, its scientific contributions and the fact it actually has a, a, an unbroken record of, of the history of radio astronomy. The second one uh, is a cultural site, but it has astronomical, astronomical connections. Essentially, these are about outstanding universal value. And that got me thinking about, in particular, Amar, because that's, that's where I work, but in fact, Ireland in general, because there's some, some tremendous astronomical heritage, particularly uh, from the 19th century. And oops, I just got to get the right button there. That's it. Uh, and that's going to lead me, I'm just going to put essentially my, my conclusions here. That's going to, uh, and then I'll go and explain why I get to this. That's going to lead me to talking about the value of, of Dunsink, uh, Ma and Burr uh, as the great triangle uh, of Ireland's uh, astronomical observatories. These are not the only historic observatories uh, in, in Ireland, but they have, truly have a tremendous heritage. I should, I'm just going to mark, note in particular, uh, Mark III Observatory in Sligo, which is unfortunately no longer here, and also Crawford uh, in, near, and near Cork which also have historical telescopes. But the three here, Dunsink and Armagh essentially have, uh, have uh, parts of their structure which are fundamental to the development of modern astronomy. Uh, and, uh, and Burr had what was the largest telescope in the world for an amazing 72 years, which actually opened up new, uh, new frontiers in astrophysics. And the three of them together, uh, running through, particularly through the 19th century, has a tremendous story and that's what I want to tell you about. So let me give you an outline of what this, uh, this, this, uh, this uh, talk is all about. Um, sorry, just getting my uh, clock going, which I forgot to do when I started. Uh, I want to very briefly outline uh, the history of the development of astronomical observatories, a huge topic. I'll try and do it in one slide, but then I'll come to the, the three great Irish observatories, Dunsink, Armagh and Burr, and talk about some of the unique uh, aspects of them. And then I'll move on to, to outlining what I understand about uh, UNESCO World Heritage, which is another topic entirely. And I have to say one that I, I, I don't have expertise in, though I am certainly uh, learning about it. It's, it is another field from what astronomers work in. And then I'll come to talking about the case for Amar, Burr, Burr and Dunsink, which I believe if, if, if this is an idea, which we think is a good one, that's the, that's the way, uh, the way I, I think we should be pursuing it. So let me go through this. Let me start by uh, giving you a sort of a, a history uh, of astronomical observatories in the century before uh, Dunsink and Armagh were founded. And essentially, observatories were buildings in which telescopes were placed, but those bu buildings weren't specifically designed uh, for the science they were doing. If I can try and explain that. Um, so the picture on the left here so shows the famous uh, Greenwich Observatory or the Royal Greenwich Observatory, of course, most famous for the Meridian, but in fact, an absolutely uh, fantastic uh, pedigree of astronomy. Indeed, Greenwich is a world heritage uh, site. Um, and the optical room where effectively you, you pointed your telescopes out the windows uh, and you were measuring the motions of the stars essentially as they passed by through them. But effectively, uh, you, the, 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 it was a building on which telescopes were placed. Uh, but as you can see, it's somewhat unwieldy. It wasn't the floors there. The, the, the setting for the telescope itself wasn't really um, optimized for the science it's trying to do. That is what I'm going to come to with Dunsink and Armagh. And then we go to the King's Observatory in, in Richmond. This is in Richmond, London. Uh, this is actually King George III, who was actually a, a, a very keen, I guess you can call it amateur astronomer, but he was well endowed and he could afford to build his own observatory. And in fact, it was all around the famous transit of Venus in 1769. So he had this observatory with a dome on, uh, probably the very first dome, but it was essentially a dome uh, on top of the building. The, it, the dome was not supported. 
Uh, these days, by the way, all the instruments uh, from the King's Observatory are, are actually here in our mass. So we actually have a, have a, a heritage link to that. And the telescopes that, uh, the, that King George used are actually in our archives here. And that forms part of the story. But the key development which uh, took place first in Dunsink in 1785, and then five years later in Armagh, was the observatory design essentially being driven by the science that's going to be performed. In essence, you can see it from these two pictures of the two observatories uh, from today. We have the, the central dome, and that dome is on a pier, and that pier goes into the ground. So effectively, uh, the, the, the dome, which can rotate and turn, the pier, which supports it, and it's isolated from the rest of the building because the buildings themselves were working buildings. In fact, they were houses. They were actually the home for the, the, the observatory directors and their families. Uh, and, and you didn't want it to be suffering from the sense of the vibrations of people moving around. So this was a key feature in the development uh, of the observatory itself. Uh, and of course, that has led on to the modern observatories uh, and, and, and essentially where they're built with the science uh, as the key, uh, as the driving forward. But the other part of my story is to talk about Burr uh, and the, well, the famous Leviathan, the six foot telescope, but in fact, Burr is not just famous for one telescope, it's actually famous for two. Uh, they were twi twice did the, uh, the, uh, the Earl of Ross, the third Earl of Ross, uh, build the world's largest telescope. In fact, three, it turns out in three times in Irish, Irish history has the world's largest telescope been built here, because prior to that, there was a telescope in Mark III, a refractor, which is also the world's largest refractor. Unfortunately, that's no longer with us. But uh, what the Earl of Ross did here in Burr, we can see in this famous painting by Henrietta Crompton, this is actually bringing out the primary mirror for the, the Leviathan. You can see that sort of that, um, that, uh, that tube, that black tube in the center, which moved up in, in the meridian line, uh, but it was six foot in diameter. And that was the, 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 um, the, 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 the aperture, which allowed you to see things that could not be seen before. But in the background of this, you can also see um, the previous telescope that the, uh, the Earl of Ross had built, the three foot telescope, which also was the world's largest telescope. And in fact, much of the science that was done at Burr was actually done with a three foot telescope. It all, wasn't all done with a six foot telescope, uh, as I'll say. And of course, the other aspect of this is that the castles in, in, the, in the background uh, where the, the Parsons uh, family are, the Earl of Ross, and in fact, that is still inhabited and lived in today. And, and the current old, the seventh old Brendan Parsons and Alison Parsons, um, uh, Lord and Lady Ross still live in there today. So that connection is still there uh, with it. There's three great scientists I want to part of, put, do as part of the story, and they all essentially uh, were at the same period. Uh, they were all the third uh, in their line. There was the third director in Dunsink, the third director in Armagh, and the third Earl of Ross. So if I take them from, from if I guess, an age order, the oldest was uh, Romney Robinson, who was the great astronomer. His contribution here was he was the astronomer who, who essentially set the, the scientific direction. Uh, we had a Dunsink. Uh, sorry, actually, I'll, I'll, oh yeah, I'll, I'll go Dunsink next. In Dunsink, we had, um, we had the great mathematician, William Hamilton. Uh, all physicists and mathematicians and they around the world know of Hamilton because of, because of the Hamiltonian itself. But he was uh, one of the world's finest ever mathematicians. He wasn't so much an astronomer. But of course, he's applying his mathematics at times to astronomy. And then we had the great engineer, the great engineer, the Earl of Ross, who actually was able to come up with a design, actually build a telescope himself, as they say, who was twice the world's large, he built the world's largest telescope. And so let me just very uh, quickly in one slide outline what these observatories were trying to do in terms of the science. Essentially, Armagh and Dunsink, I guess you can call these professional observatories that were set up. Uh, essentially as, as institutions, and they were doing um, precise astronomy. They were doing positional astronomy, very precise measurements, essentially with timekeeping to measure the positions of the stars and to make accurate star catalogs. Of course, the driving part of this wasn't necessarily the actual measurements of, of the star positions, it was actually the need to measure precise time, and particularly uh, Dunsink time, which was essentially the standard time uh, for Dublin. And in fact, Armagh had its own Armagh time. In fact, one of the great experiments of the early days was measuring the difference between Armagh time and Dunsink time uh, through these observatories. But basically positional astronomy, uh, and in fact, one of the great outputs in the early part of the uh, 19th century was this book I have on the, show on the right there, The Place of the 5,345 Stars, 
which is essentially the star catalog produced uh, in Armagh. Burr, on the other hand, wasn't uh, doing precise measurements of stars. The great aperture of the telescope allowed you to see what the, the fuzzy objects in the sky were looking like. And these were the nebulae, they called it the enigma of the nebulae. And in fact, many of the nebulae that were, were, were drawn, I couldn't say image because it had to be drawn. It was, it was a very, uh, very, uh, it was a very difficult task. It was a very, um, you had to basically be it, standing in the dark, trying to, uh, to, 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 to sketch what you were seeing. Many of these nebulae turned out to be what we now know as galaxies. And the subject of extragraphic astronomy really started from the work done at Burr. So let me go through and outline some of the, some, a bit more detail. So uh, in, in Dunn Sink, um, today, the, the, the telescope, the, 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 the big telescope that's left is, is the, they call it the South Telescope. South, not because uh, it's facing South, it's after James South, who was a benefactor of the rich, essentially English aristocrat, who, uh, who um, had properties actually all over Britain and Ireland, and he, he essentially um, funded it. Uh, and um, uh, and it's, has a, it's a 12 inch refractor by Thomas Grubb, uh, this fantastic tradition of, of telescope uh, building through, through the Grubbs, uh, the Grubb family. It built on the fact on the original uh, telescope built for Mark III. Uh, this one here from, from 1868. And this one here, of course, is still here, to, here today uh, and can be experienced. But I guess the great science that came out was actually the science uh, of Hamilton itself. I have to say there's more than one Hamilton in, 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 uh, in Irish science, and we have a Hamilton here in, in Armagh, who was the first director. But William Rowan Hamilton is known throughout the world as one of the world's finest mathematicians. Uh, and all of those who've done physics and maths degrees, of course, know about the Hamiltonian a fundamental uh, in mechanics. And later on, quantum mechanics. Quantum mechanics hadn't essentially been invented when Hamilton was around, but his ideas carried on to quantum mechanics. But he's also known for what are called quaternions, and, and quaternions are basically an extension to the complex number system. And there's a famous formula, which I've put up here. If you're a mathematician, you'll know what that means. I won't repeat it, though, if you're a non-mathematician. But basically, it helps. Uh, it actually has great application these days in what's called non-commutative non multiplication, which is basically dealing with rotations. And the, uh, the, anima the computer animation industry used it. But uh, ha Hamilton came up with this, this idea, and, and, and indeed, he's supposed to have come up with it while walking down the canal one day uh, and a place called Broom Bridge uh, near Dunsink, where there's an inscription where he's, 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 the legend has that he wrote the, uh, wrote the formula uh, on there. And there's, a, there's a, a memorial today to remember this. But this is a, 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 a very important event um, uh, in terms of in mathematics. To turn to our mark. What Ma in particular has, has um, which just marks it out, is that Ma has been in continuous use for the purpose it was built for, in other words, astronomy, since its foundation uh, in 1790. It, 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 there's never been a time when uh, the astronomer has not been there. That's not to say that the science has always been uh, first rate the entire time. There have been gaps when the productivity has, 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 has lessened. But nevertheless, the astronomer has never moved out, and that has meant the the clocks, the telescopes, the instruments are all still here today. And this gives it a tremendous heritage because you can actually see the development of the astronomical telescope through its, through its entire history. And that's what I'm going to very quickly outline to you today. So, for instance, clocks, or, or what you call regulators, is basically the timepieces. Uh, and we had in our mass some of the leading timepieces of the day, basically the most accurate clocks. And the key point here is that you can measure. Uh, positions of stars when they pass the meridian uh, accurately, you can, well, if you measure the time they pass, you can measure the position. That's what it comes down to. I just want to point out two of the clocks. The Shelton clock of 1769 is actually the one that King George III used uh, when measuring the transit of Venus. It's also similar to the one that uh, Captain Cook had when uh, charting the South Seas uh, and coming across the, uh, the east coast of Australia, which is, uh, of course, my, my origins over there, too. Uh, and then there's the famous Earnshaw clock, which was actually the most accurate clock of its day. Oh, Earnshaw number one, uh, uh, we believe it was accurate. Uh, one we want to measure it to about one quarter of a second per day. Uh, and that was fundamental to the timekeeping he had uh, when he was uh, ma making his star catalog. So we had the clocks in our mark. And we have the telescopes. And in fact, there are actually six generations of telescopes uh, in the observatory today, going from King George III's uh, telescope, which uh, is, is, is transportable, it's movable, 
1769. In fact, all the way to what we call the Amar Robotic Telescope, which in fact a number of students, uh, particularly those at Trinity, in fact, have used for projects installed a few years ago. But what I'm going to tell you about are three telescopes in particular here, and I'll go to the next slide, which illustrate the development uh, of the what I call the clock driven equatorial telescope. So they're fundamental uh, in, 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 the, in the development of the subject of astronomy, how it, how it moved and how the technology allowed us to, to, to essentially see the stars better. We start from the Troughton Equatorial, which is our oldest telescope. It's uh, seven, so there were two brothers, Edward and John Troughton from London, who were essentially commissioned uh, from advice on the astronomer world at the time, Neville Maskelin. And it was installed in, in Armagh in 1795. And it, was, it goes back to the origins of the concept of an equatorial telescope in, in the first place, where basically it's lined up parallel to the Earth's equator. So you only have to move in one direction to follow a star. Um, and it's still here today. And it now is the essentially the oldest telescope in the world in its original setting inside a dome. Um, it turns out that the technology for it was not the right way to go ahead and, and that developed because in fact it's too flexible the telescope is wonderful brass uh, structures you see there and the way it's pinned up actually mean it's not as stable as it should be so the science it did was a little somewhat limited but the technology demonstrator was important the next telescope i have here is a grub telescope which actually developed uh, from the actually the mark III telescope but this was a reflecting telescope. In fact, it possibly was the largest reflecting telescope at the time, which was equatorial. I'm not entirely sure that I have to check that one up. But it, the key thing for it was that it was um, a clock driven. In other words, it could, it could actually, uh, it, essentially the, 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 the tick tock of the clock essentially controlled it. There was a system of, of, of governors, uh, rotating governors, which were driven by the clock and allowed it to, uh, follow the stars uh, essentially automatically. The Troughton telescope, you actually had to physically move the telescope. It also had, had some other fundamental features. In fact, it had a way of supporting the, the, the mirror mount, which is now used in telescopes around the world. It's the first time this was introduced. Unfortunately, the Grub 15 inch is not fully complete here at, Ma, at, at Armagh. There's a long story here and I won't go into full details, but a predecessor of mine 100 years ago, the director, at the time did not think that this was a particularly useful telescope and basically he sold off the tube and fittings for scrap and then many years later actually very much thanks to, to John Butler who uh, uh, we if, uh, much of it was uh, we, or some of it was recovered actually from a local school here so what we have today is a restored telescope it's some parts are original but it's not fully uh, fully um, fully uh, original and then we go to the grub 10 inch which is actually a refractor telescope which actually works today, a beautiful clock-driven one. There's no, mo there's, there's no electric motors here, but it runs essentially uh, with a falling weight uh, under the weight of gravity, moving it around. And as I'm gonna talk in my next uh, slide, this was fund or a couple of slides, and this was fundamental for producing a very famous star catalog called the NGC. So these are here, witness to the development of the clock-driven equatorial telescope. But I also wanna point out that there's a number of other key parts of the heritage here in Armagh, and one of them is the meteorological record along with uh, measuring uh, stars we've been measuring the weather since 1795 and there's a number of innovations in the meteorological uh, field and particularly what's called the robinson cup anemometer which was in fact designed uh, and invented by uh, my predecessor uh, romney robinson uh, in the middle 1800s and this is the oldest one in the world that's still still here it's on our on our um, on, on our observatory building today but perhaps what our mars most known of for these days is the new general catalog. Certainly all the professional astronomers know the NGC because most of the uh, interesting objects uh, in astronomy, at least those outside the solar system, um, the fuzzy objects in the night sky are uh, NGC numbers. And the NGC uh, was produced by our, our fourth director here, um, Drea, but in fact it builds upon work of astronomers all over the world and including across Ireland. And while he used the, the 10 inch refractor here in Armagh, to check and verify the entries in it. In fact, it builds upon work that both Drea did and other astronomers did both in Ireland and elsewhere around the world. I've listed up some of the references here. I'm, I haven't got time to go into them, but it does build a much work, including uh, John Herschel and the original general catalog of nebulae. But the key thing was this new general catalog essentially was, was correct and became the foundation 
for our, later on, X, X is a galactic astronomy because most of the interesting objects that the astronomers wanted to study uh, in, the, in the very distant universe turned out to have NGC numbers. But it also leads me to talk about this uh, gentleman here, John Lewis M. Aldrea, who was the fourth director, who actually has a heritage which, is, which it spans uh, the, the three great observatories uh, in, in Ireland. So while he was a Danish astronomer, he essentially came to Ireland for his professional career. He worked as the astronomer to the fourth, first, fourth Earl of Ross for four years. That was Lawrence Parson, uh, the, the, the son of, of, of um, uh, William Parsons. He then um, worked at Dunsink. He was the assistant to the director there, Robert Ball, for four years before then being appointed to Armagh. In fact, he was the first astronomer here to actually use the title director. Before that, they were called the keeper. Uh, and he produced uh, the, the famous uh, NGC catalogue as his principal contribution before he then moved on. In fact, he ended up his days actually in Oxford writing about the history of astronomy, astronomy and going back to his roots with Tycho Brahe, who, of course, was a very famous uh, Danish astronomer. Now I want to move on to the Leviathan, which is probably internationally will be the, by, by certainly the most famous uh, telescope uh, uh, in Ireland because Leviathan was indeed the world's largest telescope for an amazing 72 years. And it was built essentially in the peat bog in Ireland and, uh, and, uh, and, uh, and led the world for many, many years. Uh, of course, it was a unique design um, that William Parsons the third Earl came up with. You, it wasn't equatorial, you couldn't move it around the sky readily. You could basically just look uh, essentially along the meridian. There's a small bit of translational motion uh, and it was very hard to use. You had to stand on this platform high up in the sky in the dark and sketch it. But nevertheless, its huge size allowed you to see things that could not be seen before. So, in fact, there were two uh, famous astronomers uh, in the Parsons family. In fact, I've said William Parsons, he was really the engineer. He built it. But in fact, it was his son, Lawrence Parsons, who was actually the real astronomer in the family. And I'll come and explain why uh, shortly. But William Parsons worked with Romney Robinson, the third director here. And Lawrence Parsons worked with both Robert Ball, the fifth director at Dunsink, and John Dre, the fourth director in Amar, who actually uh, spent time working uh, in Burr before they got their positions in, in both uh, Dunsink and Amar. But just a few other pictures uh, from, I'll show a few pictures from the Leviathan before moving on. Of course, what's most famous about the Le Leviathan was this, uh, this mystery that it started. Uh, which was the mystery of the, the Whirlpool Nebulae, uh, an enigma which was actually not solved for long after um, both, the, both the, uh, the Earls passed away. It wasn't actually till the early part of the uh, 20th century we, um, we, we um, understood what, what, was, what was going on. But it, it, it originated with this picture from John Herschel of this kind of ring-like object. Uh, uh, and then the third oil... Uh, getting this, uh, this, this I, can't say, I can't say image, but it's not, it's a drawing uh, showing this, this, this spiral structure with all sorts of wisps in there, which we now know is actually an excellent representation of what was seen because the picture on the, on the right here actually shows a modern image of it. Uh, and it's what we now know as a spiral galaxy, a city of stars. But it, it, it essentially started a, a conversation, started a debate. Uh, the words misty chevreurs, basically hairy, hairs, uh, thin hairs, or was it vast congeries of stars? I know Romney Robertson was arguing that he, he believed he could see stars, and these were, these were vast collections of stars. It turned out that, indeed, they are vast collections of stars, but what you could see at the time was simply impossible to resolve the stars. So Romney Robertson was partly right and partly wrong, but this was a key, uh, the understanding of, of, of these objects was a key part in the development uh, of modern astronomy, essentially leading to the subject of galactic astronomy. But uh, it was actually rather subjective um, looking through uh, the eyepiece of a, of a great telescope and no more so than this famous object here, which again, all the astronomers will know about. I think we've probably seen this uh, in one or two of the talks uh, this week. Um, to Messier 1, the famous Crab Nebula, which we all know uh, as a supernova remnant. The name Crab does indeed come from Burr, and it's the name that the Earl of Ross came up with when he looked through it with his three-foot telescope, which at the time, of course, was the world's largest. He drew this sort of picture here, uh, and he called it a crab. And, and maybe it looks like a crab, maybe it doesn't. That's all, of course, subjective. But showing how difficult it is, when he looked it through with his uh, six-foot telescope, this was a drawing he had. In fact, it could become more like a bee in terms of, terms of shape. So indeed, the main crab 
was a rather subjective one, which uh, which perhaps uh, you, when you see the modern pitch today, sometimes you wonder why on earth did it doesn't have that name. But it actually goes back to the, the three foot telescope. The final picture I'm going to show from Orion actually is not drawn, drawn by the other Voss, it's drawn by one of the astronomers. And uh, the fact that the, 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 I think the fantastic name here, Binden Blood Stony. This is of what we now know as the star formation region, but in actual fact is one of the brightest nebulosities in the sky, the Orion Nebula. You can clearly see this with your own naked eye, though not in the detail we've seen here. Uh, and the drawing on the left was actually our, our, our Stoney's our drawing of it. We now know it, the picture on the right uh, shows you it. Basically, it's, it's a nebula uh, in which um, a, a, lots of young stars are forming and, and the colors there are basically hot gas, which are being lit up by the ultraviolet ray, uh, radiation. But as you can see, that picture, or that drawing rather, is still a remarkably good drawing uh, for, for what we came today. But in fact, all the, of all the art things I've done at Burr, I have to say my favorite is actually not uh, the, the, the Whirlpool Nebula. Uh, it actually is this one here. And I have to uh, have a confession here. This is about infrared astronomy. And I actually uh, started my own astronomical career doing infrared astronomy. So effectively, the birth of infrared uh, came from Burr. And it was Lawrence Parson, the fourth Earl. Uh, and essentially, he was looking at the moon. And he was looking at the moon. He was focusing the radiation. Uh, he was using, in fact, a three-foot telescope. And he was focusing it onto a, uh, onto a telescope of his own design. And he was measuring the, essentially the temperature of the moon before and after an eclipse. And essentially, infrared is all about measuring heat. Uh, not that he really knew that at the time, uh, but he, he managed to calculate uh, the temperature and he found the temperature to be, well, he found it to be 247 degrees uh, Fahrenheit. That's what he estimated it to be. Um, uh, and that was, at the time, he thought it should be, it was Fahrenheit, I should say, he thought it was below freezing. And when the astronauts finally landed on the moon, in fact, they made a measurement, it was 150 degrees. And this is a picture of the telescope uh, actually in, in the exhibition center in Burr. And in fact, if you go there today, there's actually a letter signed by Neil Armstrong, essentially commemorating the work of Lawrence Parsons. In some sense, it started off the, 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 the science of understanding the moon. Uh, and, and ultimately that was important for the moon landing uh, when they got there. So uh, this was the birth of, of infrared astronomy. And of course, moving forward, jumping uh, now uh, well, 150 years, Burr is still uh, the site of, of leading edge astronomy. And in fact, many of the talks at this meeting have been talking about this telescope here. There's now a LOFAR, a radio telescope, a very low frequency radio telescope, which is in the grounds of Burr, now doing world-class science. Dublin, our, our dancing through the Dublin Institute of Advanced Studies and Amar, uh, are part of it. In fact, back now the collaboration uh, is island-wide uh, and I have the logos up of all the universities uh, across the island who are contributing to it. So there's still that legacy of science going on in Burr today. So look, that is my very quick uh, run through uh, of, the, of the heritage associated with Burr, um, uh, Dunsink and Armagh. What I want to do now is talk about how this relates to the possibility of UNESCO World Heritage. Uh, so UNESCO is the United Nations uh, Educational, Scientific and Cultural Organization. And they have defined heritage, and I'll, I'll read it out from what I, I put here. Heritage is a legacy from the past. It's what we live with today, what we pass on to future generations. Our cultural and natural heritage are both irreplaceable sources of life and inspiration. So that's what we understand by heritage. And basically heritage is something where there's a universal application, essentially outstanding universal value. The idea is anyone in the world should appreciate the concept irrespective of where they come from. That being said, to take something through uh, to, to world heritage, uh, it has to be nominated uh, by the country in which it's located. And then there's a whole process you go through in, involving experts uh, and then there's a, uh, then decided by a vote uh, of the members uh, themselves, I mean, members of, of, of UNESCO, so essentially uh, around the world to decide it. So there's these key ideas that go into what's called world heritage. You have to have this idea of outstanding universal value, and there essentially there's a number of criteria to, to determine that, and I'm going to talk about that shortly. But there has to be authenticity and integrity. In other words, it's not just the value, the, the objects essentially have to be there and they have to be there in a form which is 
close to or as it can be to the original state. In other words, the site hasn't been dramatically uh, uh, transformed or, or changed. If you go there today, you should be able to appreciate what it was like uh, in the time in the past where that's fought for. Now, there's a number of criteria that you have to, uh, to well, you have to meet some criteria in order to put forward to World Heritage. Uh, and there's a list, you can go to the UNESCO website, it's all written down there. But there are six possible cultural criteria, or it could be a natural object, natural criteria. There's four of those. And essentially, you have to meet one of those. You don't have to meet many of them. Uh, you have to meet one of them, though, in fact, uh, it's possible to, to meet more than one. In fact, one of the discussions that has to go on is which of these criteria is the one that's most relevant uh, for, uh, for astronomy, because that's how you're going to have to build your case around the criteria. But I'm just going to mention the two which I believe are most relevant to astronomy. And there's a third which is associated with it. The, the number two is about exhibiting an important interchange of human values over a span of time or within the cultural area of, of, of the world in developments in arch architecture or technology, which essentially is what we mean by uh, an observatory uh, in its building with the telescopes inside it. Or it could be, uh, and this is number four, an outstanding example of a type of building, architectural or technological ensemble or landscape, which illustrates significant stages in human history. And what I've been talking about applies to, to, to these observatories as well. It could also be directly or tangibly associated with events or living traditions. Uh, and, and, and that essentially goes back to the idea of astronomy being an exploration for understanding our place in the universe. So that one supports the idea, but it's, it's one of those two or four is, is what it's about. So what I want to now do is just uh, very quickly go through some of the heritage which uh, is around us and is actually regarded uh, as World Heritage. There are actually three sites uh, today in Ireland which have UNESCO World Heritage sites. Two of them, I suspect most people listening to this have been to. The third, perhaps not, because it's hard to get to. Perhaps the most famous one uh, here is uh, Bruna Boina, basically the archaeological ensemble uh, of the Bend of the Boyne and what most of us call New Grange and that's a cultural site. There is the uh, natural site, the famous Giants Causeway and the Causeway Coast uh, on Northern Ireland, which is certainly in Northern Ireland, the, the, the most famous um, uh, uh, tourist spot. Uh, and that is about because it's, it's physical attributes. And then there's Skellig Michael, which I think m most people around the world know today is, as it's because of Star Wars, and that's where Luke Skywalker ended up uh, in, in, as his hermit. But in fact, Skellig Michael is a cultural site going back to the early days uh, of Christianity in Ireland. So there are these three World Heritage Sites. And in fact, one of them, uh, Newgrange, actually does have a direct relation to astronomy. And I'm putting this slide up here. I've got the statement of significance from the, from the UNESCO uh, site on the right. And basically it's telling us about the famous alignment uh, of the rising uh, at, the, at, the, um, at the winter solstice, shining down through the, through the, through the um, through the tomb and lighting up the uh, the box, right? Lighting up the, the essentially the, the grave site, I guess what you call it, at, at the back of the tomb, and, and it's only there uh, during essentially the days uh, of the winter solstice. And that uh, was essentially discovered or worked out uh, through astronomy. And in fact, what I show on the on the left is actually a picture of one of the um, display boards uh, in the visitor center. You go there today, and it's actually. Um, uh, um, Commemorating the work of Tom Ray. I hope you don't embarrass you here, Tom, by listening to this, but you are, you are noted for, in fact, you did the calculation, uh, which showed, in fact, that this alignment works not today, but in fact, 5,000 years. You have to take into account the procession uh, of the equinoxes. And when you do that, you find this was perfectly uh, aligned uh, for the, essentially the Neolithic time. So, New Grange is basically uh, one of the oldest astronomical orientated structures in the world. And the key point is, it's clearly built around that orientation, this, this, uh, this passage uh, of, the, of, the, of the sun into it, uh, this inner sanctum clearly demonstrates that. So that's what exists today, but indeed there are other possibilities, uh, what's called a tentative list, and all countries can put forward uh, properties onto what's called a tentative list. And indeed Ireland has already a num number of, 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 of possible ideas there, and that has to go through a process, uh, and indeed, there is, a, and, and the one which is perhaps the most advanced uh, is, is this one here, which I'm illustrating, which actually does come back to, 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 the, to the, uh, the ideas uh, I'll, I'll be presenting to do with um, a cultural heritage, 
And this is the Royal Sites of Ireland. So basically these are idea, these are inauguration sites, Royal, Inaugur Royal Inauguration Sites associated with the kings. And these are the kings of the provinces, the four provinces of Ireland. So we have, uh, we have um, in, 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 in Ulster, we have Eamon Mark and Navenport, which actually I pass every day uh, on the way to work here in Armagh. Uh, we have Rath Trogan uh, for Connacht. We have uh, the uh, we have um, Hill of Cashel, uh, um, and we have for Leinster. Uh, sorry, Munster. I should have said that. And for for Leinster, we have uh, Dun uh, Alana. There's uh, and then we have Tara, which is uh, in some sense the where the idea is the High King, but also the concept of Mead. Mead at one stage was regarded as a province. And finally, there's actually another site which is really regarded as being the sort of the, the geographical centre of Ireland, and that's Ushnook, and there's actually a site over there. So this was originally proposed, actually it was proposed to Eamon Macca, was actually proposed uh, from, from Northern Ireland, and that was put forward, I think, in about 2005 or so. That was indeed turned down. In fact, you can read about uh, that in, on, the, on, the, on the UNESCO site, uh, and essentially with a recommendation that um, while it was a, was a fantastic site, there was not sufficient outstanding universal value, but there was a suggestion to join in with the other sites in Ireland. And so there's been this discussion going forward about putting forward um, the, all the world sites. And indeed, there, this went on to the tentative list about actually over 10 years ago now. And a decision actually is needed uh, within the Republic about taking it forward or not, because you can't just remain uh, on the tentative list forever. And in fact, it, it's got, to the, to the time when um, decisions are going to be needed and made about whether this is still is going to be pushed um, essentially um, from, the, uh, from the Republic of Ireland because the other sites, the, most of the sites are there. But a, a key part of this, which I'm going to come to, is that this also represents potential transnational nomination because it involves essentially two different jurisdictions. So let me now then come back to the, the starting point uh, and Jodrell Bank and in fact, Risco Kaido. So, when I first heard about Jodrell Bank being put forward, essentially due to its pioneering role in the development of radio astronomy and effectively the continuous connection to frontier research from the origins of this field with extant examples of the scientific infrastructure. Well, that last bit is absolutely key because when I first heard of this, I put my hat on as an Australian coming over here, the Australian radio astronomer. I heard about this and think, well, look, we've got this in Australia. Australia has the entire history of radio astronomy in it. Uh, we have Parks, which is the equivalent of Jodrell Bank. And around the Sydney area, in fact, there were the sites uh, of much of the development of interferometry. But then I thought a bit more carefully about it. And the, and the key word there is were. Unfortunately, those sites are no longer there. Development has been allowed to take place. The original infrastructure is no longer there. What's key about Jodrell is that that infrastructure is there. Now, some of it's not particularly exciting. Some of it is no more than Nissen huts, where the original scientists actually worked, but nevertheless, it's all there. And that picture on the right, what's called the green uh, uh, around the Mark II telescope, there's more than this one, more than one big telescope uh, in Jodrell. There's also the, the extant example of the scientific infrastructure still there and present. And that was the key for Jodrell being accepted it was the fact that you could trace the development of the subject of radio astronomy with, with stuff which is still there. The other association though, the other one here was Risco Kaido um, and this is what's called the Sacred Mountains. Uh, this is in, in the Canary Islands and this is a cultural landscape and it's going back for at least 1500 years. Uh, it's an archeo-astronomical site and basically there's evidence for ritual observances of celestial uh, uh, phenomena associated with the calendar. In other words, the sun and the moon are for an extended period of time. So basically it's a cultural astronomy set within a rich historical uh, and social context. That's what it's put forward. So those were the two things that got me thinking because I'm now putting my hat on as the director of Armagh. And when I heard about that, I thought, gosh, here in Armagh, we've got both those attributes. We've got the, uh, the scientific attribute uh, of an observatory where science has been done continuously uh, since it's founded. Uh, and the in situ telescopes are here. But we also have a fantastic cultural landscape around Armagh. I'll just spend a, a minute uh, explaining that for those of you who don't come from Armagh. 
So Amar does have one of the wall sites of Ireland, the Eamon Market, the going back to Neolithic settlement, and, and you can wander on it. It's only about to, about a half an hour's walk from the observatory itself. Amar has the evidence of the Christian foundation uh, in Ireland. It has the two St Patrick's cathedrals, where the two heads of the of the uh, of the church, the, the Church of Ireland and the and the Catholic Church are. And of course, there's also a, a, a direct link between the Church of Ireland and Amar Observatory, which I have discussed, but that's actually how it was founded. And then we have the observatory itself with the development of modern science. And indeed, we have the planetarium, which when it was built was essentially a symbol of the space age. It was about the same time and it went up uh, as the Apollo moon landings. And in fact, there's other aspects of Amar too. There's the first public library uh, in, in, in Ireland. And in fact, uh, in fact uh, perhaps more controversially, there's actually Bishop Usher's uh, book, which uh, did, um, works out when the, uh, the foundation of the earth at 4004 BC, that was all done in our mass. So there's a, there's a cultural heritage about uh, humanity's quest to understand our place in the cosmos, which is still evident in the buildings, monuments, and landscape today in our ma. So basically, the, I saw we had both those things in our ma. So I started thinking about, well, what could, could our ma do? And I came up with three possible scenarios. I actually wrote a discussion paper on this uh, for our board in our ma. And one was around this idea of the landscape uh, and this continuous connection with our place in the cosmos, basically, which you have in our ma. The other one was the complete opposite. You just go and look at the observatory itself uh, and the fact that you have this, uh, the role and development of science in one site, uh, the authentic authenticity and integrity. Or the third one, which is in fact the one I'm gonna come to, uh, is in fact the idea of the transnational nomination. The fact that in fact, there's much more than just our ma, there's particularly the contributions done in Bern, done sink, and the three together what makes uh, particularly outstanding. So there's this leading role in the 19th century in world astronomy. Um, Mao and Dunsink in particular represented when the design of the observatory building became central to their function. Burr, where twice had the world's largest telescope and the spiral nebulae and our, our understanding, the profound nature of understanding of our place in the cosmos, which came from that work, and um, Mao would be the telescopes. So when I, I had these three ideas, but then I started talking to colleagues about this, and the idea of the landscape, while, while it's, it sounds great, is actually too vague a concept. You can't pin it down precisely enough for what the, the, the UNESCO committee uh, would want. The observatory was, well, of course, I love that idea, being the director here, is actually not sufficient of itself. And, and you can look at that because even a, 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 an observatory like Greenwich is actually not a World Heritage Site by itself. It's part of a larger structure. So it'd be a very big ask to put forward a Mar observatory by itself. So I actually think the, the, the answer here, or if we're going to go forward, is to consider this transnational nomination. So basically, um, Irish observatories of the 19th century, so okay, not 1785, not quite the 19th century, but um, it's representing key stages in the development of astronomical observatories and telescopes throughout that period through what you can still see today in these observatories and also this the science as the key contributions to the changing of humanity's perception about our place in the cosmos. And that's a particular story about uh, understanding galaxies and where we are. So here there's a coherent common theme over a well-defined time period. Not only that, there's also significant architectural merit. You can see the three pictures at the bottom, uh, which are modern pictures, uh, and there's, there's fantastic uh, archaeological merit architectural merit, I should say, uh, to the, the buildings today, which is actually a very important part of the process. They clearly have outstanding universal value and there's authentic, authenticity and integrity because you can indeed, you can trace the development of the subject. You can see the instruments, the telescopes that were used uh, back in the uh, 19th century. You can see them here today. So essentially that's the idea I want to put forward. To finish up with though, I, am, I, I, I won't go through this in any detail, but there are of course lots of questions that need to be asked. It's not just a matter of saying, oh, it's a great idea, write, write, a, write a proposal on a couple of pages of paper and send it in. There's a long roll to go in here. In fact, the, the process itself could well take 10 years. And I just want to put a few dot points. I'm happy to talk about these more in questions if anyone wants to do it. One is the role of the International Astronomical Union. Uh, and there is a commission, Commission C4 World Heritage uh, and Astronomy. And it's quite possible one of the people listening on YouTube is the uh, retiring president, Gudrun Wolfschmidt, uh, who I, I'd like to acknowledge uh, if she is listening. 
uh, she has actually led uh, the development uh, of, 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 um, of, of astronomical heritage over the past uh, few years in her term. And indeed, there's now a UNESCO IOU register of outstanding astronomical heritage, which I'll finish up with my final slide, but you will see some of the uh, outstanding heritage on that, on that site. So that's the role of the IAU. And I, I should also note, by the way, that I have just assumed the role of the Vice President of Commission C4 in the recent I IAU elections. One key item which will need intense discussion is that if this is to go forward, it becomes what's called a transnational nomination because essentially there are two jurisdictions. There's the UK, because I'm uh, part of the UK, and of course, Burr and uh, Dunsink are part of the Republic. So two countries have to get involved, which in some sense can make it twice as difficult because you have to have two sets of uh, processes to go through, but it does need to be led uh, by one of those countries. And in fact, the, the natural one, in fact, here would be the Republic to be leading this um, uh, um, if so. And then there's all sorts of issues about how you go through the process. And without going into the detail, you have to prepare a nomination. The nomination is an extensive piece of work. It's an academic piece of work. Uh, there's got to be what's called a comparative analysis uh, of other potential sites. And if you look at the Jodrell, um, uh, the Jodrell one, that's actually a very uh, major bit of work. And radio astronomy is a re relatively recent uh, field. It's only sort of 60, 70 years old. Optical astronomy, of course, has been running since 1610, uh, I guess, with the uh, well, telescopes anyway, with Galileo. So that comparative analysis, which is necessary, is going to be important. And then you have to start thinking carefully about boundaries for the sites. And again, this is this is this is the whole lot of discussion here. But I'll just point out that just because you're world heritage does not mean to say that you have to freeze the site. And the example here is Jodrell Bank itself. Jodrell Bank is now a world heritage site, but it's also the site. Of the headquarters of the Square Kilometre Array, and that's within the area, uh, and they've managed to find a way of dealing with that as part of the, uh, the, the, the nomination process itself. So you haven't got to freeze the site, you can still continue to work on the site, but you need perhaps to be knowledgeable about what the site is there for as part of it. And finally, there's going to have to be a whole lot about management plans, looking after the heritage, uh, the lighting, development around there, how that's going to be managed. That's going to have to bring in the, not just the, 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 ob the observers themselves, but their councils and indeed the, the nations around it. And there has to be an education and outreach program about this because heritage, you've not just got to have it there, but you've got to tell the public about it. But in fact, that's an area where we are already very strong. We do in our Ma and Burr and there's plans for developing the outreach and, and heritage and done sink further. We actually do have very strong visitor programs in these places, which can be uh, can be can carry on to to do that. But that will be a very important part of the process: is knowing how you're going to deal with visitors and tourism uh, and education and outreach. So to finish on my talk, I'm just going to show this uh, this uh, picture here, which is actually just a screenshot taken from the portal to the heritage of astronomy uh, from the from the IAU UNESCO site, uh, and you can see those uh, those yellow dots. So this is what these are not all UNESCO properties. There are some UNESCO properties in there, but these are the sites which are now on there. And if you go to this site and click, you will actually find citations. So there's actually academic citations, which will give you more detail. But clearly here we have Ma, we have uh, Dunsink, and we have Burr. And then some of the sites are across in Britain, uh, just to, I won't go through them all, but this one here, for instance, is Stonehenge, which, uh, as you might imagine, has got uh, interesting uh, celestial alignments as well. And of course, uh, there's Jodrell Bank here, there's, the, there's Greenwich over here, and that's actually the Royal Observatory in Edinburgh. And at that point, I think I'm going to stop my talk, and I will stop sharing the screen, and I'll hand back to the, uh, the organisers. Uh, thank you very much for that, uh, Michael. It's a very interesting talk. So um, we'll be taking in questions uh, through both the Slack and YouTube comments, and that has led to me opening multiple screens in front of me and indeed having to rush off and get another computer. Uh, but uh, hopefully we'll be able to get uh, some good questions in there as we do. So the, the first comment I have from um, uh, Rock Nezik on YouTube it was more a comment than a question. I was just uh, noting that you, the coincidence that your um, 
your picture there of the Whirlpool uh, Galaxy M51. Uh, coincidentally, today, the astronomy picture of the day is also a modern picture of M51. So, well, how about that? How about that? I didn't know that. <laughs> but that just shows you how important the Whirlpool is to the... Uh, it still continues to be important, and there's been absolutely spectacular images. It's certainly one of the most inspiring images of the night sky. You only got to put that picture up in a public talk, and everyone uh, awes and gasps over it. Uh, so yes, that's a that's a very useful comment. I see a couple of people typing away, but um, another comment from uh, from Rock over on um, on the YouTube comments again uh, was that the uh, transnational idea does seem uh, like a rather strong one, and uh, not only does it add. Uh, more interest overall uh, than a than a single site, but uh, as you say, the th uh, the three are closely related, as as you point out. So that, that was a very uh, interesting comment. I think it's it's hooked the minds of some of the people. Yes, there. It, it 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 hooks the minds. It has advantages and disadvantages, and indeed, we'll need a lot of discussion. But if the two sides come together to do it, I think it strengthens the case no end because it's it's more than just one country saying it, but it also complicates it. Uh, no end because you've got to have agreement and we know how difficult it is to get a, agreement at times so um while, while that that uh, other comment is is typing up i think i might uh, ask one of my own uh which is i suppose um what what I suppose steps do you think next steps would need to be taken if there if this is something to to go ahead? Do we need to go go to government or to go to the you know, the directors of the uh, the agencies? I think possibly some of whom are on this ready call and they, they may have been blindsided by this a little. But anyway, <laughs> well, <laughs> what would indeed, and, and so in some sense, this represents the first time we're trying to. At least my time talking about this publicly. I have talked about this with with my own board here in Armagh, and I've talked to colleagues in in in, in Dublin and and and, uh, and 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 Burr. But in terms of of, of putting forward an idea, and look, one of the first things is 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 I, I think we need to be talking about this as a community of astronomers. I mean, if, if the astronomy community doesn't think this is a good idea, it's not worth pursuing it because the because uh, uh, if there's if 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 if, if if a significant number of the astronomers stand up saying no, we shouldn't be doing this. That's not going to really support in, in long in, in long run. But this is much more than just astronomers. This indeed, uh, it, it is. It's about cultural. It's about our uh, identity as as a species in some sense, uh, and and therefore uh, it, it's going to need agreement across all levels of of society. So I mean, it's not just the institutions involved, but the the local councils in in those areas. And what I didn't just this discussed in detail. One of the biggest issues to do with the world sites of Ireland is actually there's, I know there's disagreement with the various local authorities about whether they should or shouldn't put, put that forward. Some local authorities like the idea, other local authorities don't. But ultimately, these are decisions by national governments. And indeed, I have been talking to uh, um, so, uh, the relevant uh, authorities here in Northern Ireland, uh, only preliminary discussions, but I've, I've kept them informed uh, in, in, our, in essentially the Department of Heritage in Northern Ireland. But of course, the same sort of discussions will have to go on uh, in the Republic as well. And I, and I haven't had discussions as yet. Um, I'm not in the, in the direct position to do that. But that's so that there's a whole lot of discussions. And that's why this is not a, 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 a one or two year process. This is probably a decade long process. There is a formal process of, of a country submitting to the tentative list. Uh, which happens, there's opportunity every few years. That doesn't even happen every year. Uh, and then it gets considered and that takes a few years as well. So in short, there's a long process in front of us. Very good, very good. Okay, so we've got a question in from uh, through the Slack channel. I'm happy to take questions through any method that I can see, but I, I'm hopefully not missing them while I'm glancing around several screens. But the question from uh, Matthew Houghton, uh, which was, are there good statistics available for the increase in visitors sites awarded UNESCO World Heritage status typically get? And do the three sites have the infrastructure to deal with a significant increase in visitor numbers? So this is, yeah, these are all sorts of things that will need to be thought about carefully in, in, in any, any proposal. I mean, that's where the management plan comes in. But are there statistics? Yeah, I mean, yes, there are. There have been studies. Certainly, I've seen studies done uh, in, of the UK sites, I've got a, a document which actually analyzes 
half a dozen different sites. And the, and the short answer is there's no single answer. It does depend very much on the nature of the site. So for instance, the document I read, uh, the Tower of London, for instance, of course, is, is as, as you might expect, a, a World Heritage Site. It made absolutely no difference becoming UNESCO on the Tower of London because it was already saturated. But some of the, the lesser known sites, it's made a huge difference. Sometimes, though, it's made no difference. And, and part of that depends upon how it is promoted and whether you, how, how much you want to promote it. But yes, these are important questions which will have to be a part of any analysis. Uh, and, that's, and there's also a cost involved in, in doing it. And, and you, 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 need to have a, you need to have a management plan as part of it, which will deal with that. But at the same time, we are, we're not starting from scratch here. Uh, certainly in uh, Mao and Burr, we are used to having visitors. I mean, we are, we are a public visitor centre and we have, we have over 50,000 a year in our site and they have over 100,000, I believe, in Burr. So it's not like we're starting from, from scratch. Very, uh, very good and look, uh, nice comprehensive answer there. Great. Uh, so I've got a question uh, from the Zoom chat. Um, uh, from Terry Mosley, uh, which was, uh, surely Herschel's 48 inch was the largest until the six foot at Burr was built. Uh, so I know that there was an intermediate um, in there. I, well, I, actually, I, I, I'm not sure whether it was still up and running anyway, uh, but there's, there's a time and I bet, uh, was that, that was, yeah, hold on, that was a, yeah, that was a refactor, that was a refactor, wasn't it? And this is the reflector. Yes, so the difference between reflectors and refactors uh, in, in, the, in, in that. And that's also where the Mark III one comes in as well, um, and, and being an equatorial telescope. So there's a, there's a number, of, uh, number of riders you have to, to put with what kind of telescope are you talking about? Very good. Um, yeah, always uh, nice to start splitting the, the, the distance there. Um, Terry's other question, I think, has already been answered by the, the, um, the talk, which is uh, the UNESCO criteria refer to a country. Is it possible to present a joint cross-border proposal? I think you've fairly thoroughly addressed that one. And another comment from uh, Peter Gallagher. Um, as you know, I think it's a great idea, Michael. We'll be happy to support it with both my Dunsink and Burr hats on, so uh, have some support there. Uh, great, mm -hmm. I think that, that it sounds like there have been conversations already. Um, uh, Dave Moore from Astronomy Ireland uh, has makes a comment. Uh, Astronomy Ireland was delighted to help in getting funding to restore the Burr telescope and see it as um, see it as a UNESCO heritage site would be something we support one hundred percent. Presume your discussion with Burr there in favour of this, as it is privately owned after all. Yes, and, and, they, and they, look, these are all important things, and indeed, uh, the, the discussion, the discussions there between the, the three sites, we've, we've, we've all talked about it, but indeed, these are, these are ongoing discussions, but yes, that's correct. And the last comment I have here that's come in, uh, so far at least, uh, is from YouTube again, and uh, it's uh, Gudrun Wolfschmidt. Uh, ah, thank you, Michael. I liked your, uh, your, your presentation. Just a, a lovely okay. thanks there. Okay, well, and uh, thank you, Goodwin, because Goodwin is a person who's got me thinking hard about this, so appreciate that, Goodwin. <laughs> okay, so with that, I think that is all of the questions we've had. Um, thank you very much, uh, Professor Mike Burton, for this, this presentation and this talk, and uh, thank all of you for, for coming today. And um, I think we'll we'll wrap up here. So uh, our uh, main conference uh, business will continue tomorrow um, uh, with the the attendees at eleven a.m. We have had a slight change to the schedule in that uh, Anna will not be able to be presenting, unfortunately, uh, to, to personal circumstances. Uh, so Meg from will be uh, taking over that slot, and we'll be starting at eleven with our morning announcements instead of ten fifty. So uh, that's, uh, but everyone else who has a talk schedule, don't worry about it. We've slotted this in without having to disrupt anyone else. So uh, most of all, thank you to Michael for this evening's talk. Okay. Thank you. Thank you.